Section 18 of Astounding Stories 12, December 1930, by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Ape Men of Zlotli, by David R. Sparks. Chapter 5 Before Kirby was more than half set to fight, the priest was clawing at his throat, and a gnarled old fist was poised to drive the knife in a death stroke. Kirby did the only thing he could do quickly, sprang to one side. The move saved him. The knife whipped past his shoulder, and the cacique nearly fell, but it had been a close enough squeak for all that. Nor was it over. After Kirby, the priest sprang with unexpected agility, and before Kirby could snatch at his pistol the talon hands were lunging at his throat once more. With the gasps of the girls ringing in his ears, Kirby bunched himself for another side leap, only to find the cacique all over him like an octopus. Momentarily the knife hung above his chest, and Kirby, dismayed at the powers of his opponent, almost felt that the thing must plunge before he could break the octopus hold. But he had no intention of being defeated, and now he was getting used to the fight. The priest's left arm swiftly clenched about his neck and shoulders and the right arm, with the knife, attempted to drive through to the heart. Suddenly, however, Kirby lurched sideways and backward, and as the octopus grip slackened for a flash, he himself got a wrestler's grip that left him ready to do business. As the priest broke free, he slid around in an attempt to fasten himself on Kirby's back. Quickly, tensely, Kirby doubled, and knew that he had done enough. The cacique shot over his shoulders, described a somersault in mid-air, and landed with a sharp crack of head and shoulders against unyielding stone. From the semicircle of other priests went up a gasp. From Naida came a strangled cry of joy. Kirby made one leap for the knife which had fallen from the cacique's hand as he slumped into unconsciousness, and then he straightened up with the weapon safe in his possession. "'There, you old billy goat,' he croaked in English. "'Maybe you won't try any more fast ones for a while.' A second later he stepped over the sprawled body to stand beside Naida. Upon the wrinkled countenances of the remaining cacique was stamped a look of dismay and hatred which boded no good. It was plain to Kirby that in battering up the man detailed to kill him he had committed a desecration of the First Order. "'Is there anyone else who cares to fight?' he flung at them in Spanish, showing a contempt as great as their rage. The response he got was instant, from one old gullet then from others came choking, snarling sounds which presently became words. By those words Kirby heard himself cursed with a vituperation which made him, even in his temporary triumph, feel grave. But he did not let that soberness trouble him long. For the main point now was that no one made a move to fight further, which was what he had expected. He had flung them the challenge, knowing that he was possessed of their knife, and suspecting that it was their only weapon. The belief that no one would care to try a barehanded conflict, no matter what insult was waiting to be avenged, seemed justified as none of the cacique advanced, and as even the cursing presently ceased. No? Kirby asked. Is there to be no more fighting? One of the cacique now came forward a few steps. No, he answered with a lameness which was not to be denied. But you, a criminal interloper in our realm, have been marked as a victim for sacrifice, and from this there is no power in the universe which can save you. Kirby, after a reassuring glance at Naida, looked at the floored priest who was sitting up now, looking stupidly about, and feeling himself all over, and Kirby suppressed a grin. Ah, I am to be sacrificed, eh? But what happens until that time comes? Listen, my wise ones. He stabbed a finger at them, and his eyes flashed. "'Listen. What you mean to say is that I have defeated you, and you must lay off me until you can launch another attack. But I have a few things to say to that. One is that I am not going to permit myself to be sacrificed. Another is that I demand, right here and now, that you begin to discuss with me certain agreements which are going to regulate the future conduct of affairs in this world to which I have come.' A low exclamation answered that, but it came from no priest. They remained sullen and staggered. It was Naida who murmured, and there was excitement and pleasure in her voice. Suddenly she placed her lips against Kirby's ear. "'You must not treat with them,' she said. "'Tell them you want to see the Duca, and will destroy them all unless he comes.' 
Understanding burst over Kirby. The Duca. Then these men were only the representatives of a high priest. The Duca. Yes, he repeated resolutely to the assembled greybeards, a meeting is going to be held in this chamber of council at once. But I will not deal with you. Do you understand me? I must see the Duca. I leave it to you to decide whether you will summon him, or force me to fight my way through to wherever he is staying. The Duca! The words burst in dismay from the gimlet-eyed cacique who had said there would be no more fighting. He looked at Naida, well aware of the fact that it was her interference which had made Kirby extend his demand, and his look was black. Kirby slid between Naida and the cacique. Yes, he spat out, the Duca! Will you summon him, or— He did not repeat what he would do as an alternative. A second passed in silence. It seemed as if the cacique who had been speaking was ready to burst. "'Answer me!' Kirby thundered. And then the priest obeyed. "'Very well,' he growled in a voice which quaked with rage. "'I obey. But you will wish you had never made the demand.' The next second he swung on his heel, and leaving his company behind as a guard, headed toward a stair which led upward from one side of the amphitheatre, and which was protected by a door of heavy grilled metal work. The stairway seemed to be spiral, and was all enclosed. Kirby realized that it must lead into the tall and beautiful tower of obsidian which he had seen outside. "'Oh!' Naida whispered as looks and smiles of approval came from all of the girls. "'You have been magnificent. Mark now what we must do. You must be the one to state our terms, because you have already won a victory for us. Tell the Duca that we will not submit to any compromise with the ape-men, and least of all will we let any of our number go to the ape-men." A deep flush crept into Kirby's cheeks at the thought of what he would like to do to the man who had proposed that sacrifice. "'Then tell him,' Naida continued, "'that we want men brought to our world from the world above, and finally tell him we will live under his dictatorship no longer and hereafter demand a voice in all councils affecting temporal affairs." "'All right,' Kirby spoke grimly. "'I'll tell him. Naida, is this high priest we're waiting for, the one who proposed sacrifice of some of you to the apes?' Naida nodded. Next moment she, Kirby, and all the others, including the row of glowering cacique, became silent. At sounds from above all looked toward the grilled doorway to the tower. Then Kirby realized that all of the girls, as well as the cacique, were dropping to their knees. No, he commanded quickly. Get up. You must not abase— He had not finished, and Naida had scarcely risen, when the heavy door swung on noiseless hinges. The light in the amphitheatre seemed to become more intense. Then, against the great glow, Kirby beheld majesty, beheld one who represented the apotheosis of priestly rank and power. Clad in robes of filmy material which glimmered white beside the gray robes of his underlings, the duca wore about his waist the living flame of a girdle composed of alternate cut diamonds and blood-red rubies, each larger than a golf ball. And Kirby, searching for comparisons, realized that the duca's face, upheld to others, would be as remarkable as his jewels must be when compared to ordinary gems. It was a chiseled face, seamed by a thousand wrinkles which a god might have carved from ivory before endowing it with the flush and glow of life. A mane of snow-white hair cascaded back from a tremendous forehead to fall about thin but square shoulders and mingle with the downward sweep of pure white beard. The eyes, black as polished jet, flamed now with the glare of baleful fires. As Naida, stealing close to Kirby, trembled, and even the abased cacique trembled, Kirby himself felt as if icy water was trickling over him. He fought the sensation off, for suddenly he knew that in spite of first impressions, which made the man seem a living god, the old duca was human, and what was more, he was in the wrong, all of which being true, the thing to do was to keep a level head and fight. All at once Kirby spoke across the silence in the great room. "'I have sent for you,' he said, weighing words carefully. "'And I,' the Duca's voice was mellow and deep, "'have come. But I am not here because you summoned me.' "'Oh,' Kirby let sarcasm edge his words, "'well, I won't quibble about your motives for coming. Did my messenger tell you why we are here, 
and demand your presence. Your messenger, the old man said calmly, told me. Very well. Do you consent to listen to Naida's and my terms? If you will, listen. But wait a moment, the Duca interrupted, still calmly, but with a look in his eyes which Kirby did not like. Are you asking me, to my face, whether I will listen to terms which you offer as self-styled victor of a battle with my cacique? Kirby nodded. His apprehension increased. Ah, said the Duca softly, and then amazingly a smile deepened every wrinkle of his parchment face. But do you not remember that I said I had not come here because you summoned me? Yes, Kirby said solidly, I remember very well. The thing which brought me here was the failure of my followers to accomplish an assignment which I had given them, namely, that of ending your life. Hmm. Kirby scratched behind his ear. You are not interested in arranging terms of peace, then. I am here, suddenly the Duca's voice filled the room, to do that which my priests were unable to do. And the moment has come when the gods will no longer trifle with you, you dog, you thieving intruder. You— Swiftly the Duca plunged one withered but still powerful hand into the folds of his robe above the flaming girdle. Then his hand flashed out, and in it he held— But Kirby did not get to see. A strangled cry of terror smote his ears. Naida leaped toward him from one side, while Elana, the lovely youngest girl, sprang from another direction, hurled Naida aside, and stopped in front of Kirby. Through the glaring room flickered a tiny red serpentine creature, which the Duca hurled from a crystalline tube in his hand. As the minute snake struck Elana's breast, she gave a choked cough, and then, as she half turned to smile at both Naida and Kirby over her shoulder, her eyes went blank, and she collapsed gently to the polished stones of the floor, dead. A second later came squirming out from under her the ghastly, glimmering little snake which had struck. Slowly, while every mortal in the room stood paralyzed, Kirby stepped forward and set his heel upon the writhing thing. When he raised his boot the snake was only a blotch on the floor. The Duca was standing as still as girls and cacique. The laughter with which he had started to greet what he had thought would be Kirby's extermination had faded to a look of wonder and fear. He was an easy mark. Up to him Kirby rolled, and with all the force of soul and muscular body drove his fist into the Duca's face. "'By God!' he roared. "'You want war, and you shall have it!' The Duca was simply out, not dead. Since Kirby did not want him dead, he did not strike again, but swung back from the sprawled body, faced Naida, and pointed to the tower door. "'Up there!' he snapped. "'Seize the tower. I have a reason.' At the Duca's crashing downfall had come to the cacique a tension which made Kirby know they would not be dummy figures much longer. His eyes never left them. "'Quick, Naida,' he snapped again. "'We must hold the tower.' Naida, all of the girls, were staring dazedly at Elana, dead. "'The tower,' she choked. "'But we cannot go there. It is the Duca's.' "'Because it is the Duca's,' Kirby said firmly, "'is exactly why we must hold it. Come, Naida, please.' And then he saw comprehension begin to dawn at last. He also saw two of the cacique glide from the wooden line and slink toward him past the unconscious Duca stealthily. As Naida suddenly cried out to her companions, pushed at two of them, and then darted like a rainbow nymph toward the silent and forbidding upward spiral of steps, Kirby faced the gliding cacique. One he clutched with vice-like hands, and lifted him. As the other shrieked and sprang, he was mowed down by the hurtling body of his fellow-priest, which Kirby flung forward mightily. The rest of the cacique were howling. While Naida waited beside the tower door, the other girls flashed up the steps. The Duca still lay where he had fallen, a thread of blood oozing from his mouth. Kirby, after his last look over all, solemnly stooped and gathered in his arms the limp, radiant little body of the girl who had given her life that her friends might be left with a leader. A moment later he was standing on the steps. Naida, unopposed by the still stupefied cacique, swung shut the tower door and shot a double bolt. Naida, Kirby whispered as he held Elana closer to him. Oh, I am so sorry. 
that we could have won only at such a price. As Naida stooped to kiss the pale little forehead with its halo of golden hair, sobs came, but then she raised her eyes, and they were for Kirby alight with the message that she could and would accept Alana's sacrifice, because she would gladly have made it herself. "'We will not forget,' she whispered. "'Carry her tenderly, and come. For better, for worse, the Duca's tower was theirs.'" End of chapter 5